Friends? Very congenial group. Okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm, I'm just uh, recovering a little bit from a cold here, so my, my uh, voice has dropped an octave. Maybe it'll, be, maybe it'll actually sound better. I don't know. Uh, let me welcome you to our first David S. Sauerman uh, provocative lecture for 2016, and thank you all for taking time out to join us this evening. My name is Jack Estel. I'm a lecturer with the uh, Department of Economics here. Before I go further, let me see. What, what would be a good thing to do? Uh, pull this thing out and, oh yeah, that's probably a really good idea. Turn it off. You might want to do the same thing. I would appreciate it. Ah, good idea. So if you have any difficulty seeing the screen um, due to our um, uh, power outage that we had uh, apparently has messed up our ability to uh, use the overhead display. So we have this. So if you have problems seeing, I hope you'll move forward. There's plenty of seats up front and Adam generally doesn't bite. So I think you're safe up here uh, if you don't get any closer than the white line. Um, let me see, what else? I'd like to ask you all if you would be interested to join us after this lecture at Flames Eatery. Flames Eatery is at the corner of uh, 4th Street and San Fernando. We will have a meeting of the Barstool Economists after this. Um, and we meet there, we'll walk over after the lecture. Uh, the department provides uh, pizzas and some beer, uh, as well as some great, and soft drinks, as well as some uh, great discussion, and as I've said before, you get to hang out with us. Oh, <laughs> what fun is that? And uh, we get to hang out with you, which is actually even more fun. So uh, please join us uh, over there after this lecture. Uh, by the way, anyone uh, who would like to join the Barstool Economist, it's an online group of uh, people who are interested in economic issues. I think there's about 460 members right now. And uh, all you have to do, it's a Yahoo group, and uh, you can uh, email into one of us, and we can uh, instruct you in how to uh, get on, become a member there. Um, I'd like to point out that uh, um, we have two more provocative lectures this spring, and we are still finalizing those plans. And as soon as I have those plans finalized, I will get them out for publication. Uh, I also believe that the department, uh, or that the uh, Econ Club would like to say a couple of words. So before maybe I go any further, let me have uh, John Lind come up and uh, say a few words. Thank you. I didn't forget, right? You got my name wrong. Oh. Linford. My name's John so Linford. John Linford. <laughs> come up. John Wood. Hello, I'm the president of the Econ Club. If I've seen you before, hi, it's good to see you again. If you've never seen me before, Hello, I'm going to be around. I'm on campus a lot. Um, Econ Club's meeting this semester on Tuesdays at 4:30. If you can make the lecture or make the meetings, awesome. We're going to be trying to get a different club or a different room to meet in for next week because this week we had a really awesome turnout and the club room was clear full. Um, so we'll keep you posted on that. If you're interested in learning more about the club, come see me after. I'll for sure be at Flames. Hope to see you guys there. Enjoy the lecture. Thanks. Thank you, John Linford. I'm sorry. Uh, so this lecture series started, I always give a, a little, little talk, one, one just so I can remember Dave Sauerman, who the lecture series is named after, started almost 16 years ago um, to uh, um, facilitate our idea of the challenge of ideas and the development of critical thinking in an environment of respectful intellectual um, intercourse. So we'd like to bring ideas here that may be out of the mainstream, but still are provocative, at least to force us to think about things that we're not used to. And uh, I hope that we succeed at that tonight. Um, please relax and listen to Adam tonight as he talks about innovation. Innovation uh, for many of us, I think, who have been involved in entrepreneurship uh, is the real engine of economic change and growth. And I think he has some interesting perspectives on it. So our speaker tonight is, is Adam Thier. 
And Adam is a senior research fellow at, with the Technology Policy Program at Mercatus Center, located at George Mason University. He specializes in technology, media, internet, and free speech policies with a particular focus on online safety and digital uh, privacy. His writings have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, The Washington Post, The Atlantic, and Forbes, and he has appeared on national TV and radio. Uh, he's a frequent guest lecturer and has testified numerous times on Capitol Hill. I don't envy him. <clears throat> he's offered and authored and edited eight books on topics ranging from media regulation and child safety issues to the role of federalism uh, in high technology markets. His latest book, Permissionless Innovation, The Continuing Case for Comprehensive Technology, Technological Freedom. He also contributes to the Technology Liberation Front, a leading tech policy blog. Uh, he received his B.A. in Journalism and Political Philosophy from Indiana University and his M.A. in International Business Management and Trade Theory at the University of Maryland. So please welcome Adam. Thank you, Jack. I really appreciate that introduction. I want to thank Jack and Lydia for inviting me here to tonight to talk to you all. I, uh, I hope I can be provocative, true to the, uh, the, the theme of the, tonight's talk. And uh, in talking about innovation uh, and the future of innovation policy, uh, I hope you agree that it, it is provocative, uh, no matter how boring I might be, the topic is provocative in its own right. So uh, let me get right into it and talk about this uh, clash of visions that I see unfolding in the world of technology policy uh, and, and how it affects a variety of different policy issues going forward. And what I'll try to do as I go, as I go along is also give you some flavor for the many different types of research opportunities that exist in the fields that I'm going to be discussing here tonight. Um, because uh, as you'll see, there's just so many different issues that are sort of screaming out for attention. And there's a real lack of uh, focus, um, not just uh, among economists, but amongst public policy scholars, uh, economic historians, law students, and so on. And I'm always, uh, I'm always eager to give people ideas for interesting papers uh, to be written on these topics, or maybe collaborations with me on some of them where I could really use your help. So jumping right in, um, I know the screen's a little small. Hopefully you, you can see it. Uh, I'll try to explain most things so you don't need to really uh, pay too much attention to what's on the screen there. But most of what I'm going to discuss is in this uh, most recent book of mine that Jack mentioned on permissionless innovation. Uh, it's online, free to download. The second edition, the greatly expanded second edition, is going to be due out next month. Um, it's almost double in size from this first one. It's also based on a variety of uh, law review articles and journal articles that I have published over the past uh, five or six years um, in quite a few different journals uh, having to do with specific technology policy topics. So uh, I would encourage you to consult any of those for more detail. And by the way, if there's anything on any of the slides that you can't see, this presentation is online. If you just search for my name, Permissionless Innovation, it's on, uh, I believe, on SlideShare and a couple of other places. So what I'm going to do in, in the discussion is uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about starting the, the digital revolution, the internet uh, revolution, if you will, and talking about how that happened and what we can learn from it, and then transition into this discussion of the so-called sort of clash of visions that I outline in my book that's developing uh, around all these emerging technology issues. I'm going to talk about some of the common concerns about various types of disruptive technologies that, that end up leading to calls for uh, control of these technologies. I'll talk about social adaptation to new, ne new technologies and why that's important. And then I'll outline some constructive solutions to some of the very serious concerns that are, uh, that are raised by skeptics or critics of some of these technologies. If I have time, maybe I'll go into some uh, more detailed case studies of some of the things I've written about. But I also want to leave plenty of time for, for Q&A. Um, so maybe I'll just leave that uh, till later. So let me, uh, let me begin by asking some general questions about the recent technological innovations we've seen um, in this country and around the globe, and specifically about the rise of the internet and uh, digital technology. And I think it's worth asking, you know, where did all of this amazing innovation that we've seen in recent decades come from? Uh, we, we almost take it for granted now that we'll get new and better and faster products every single year, and somehow we get them. So. Here's a question. How did this area that we're sitting in right now, how did it develop so quickly? How did all of these companies, and you probably can't see it on that image there on that television, but these are all these logos for these major innovators, technology companies that are in this area that you call home uh, here in the Valley area. And if you would have taken the same snapshot 
just three years ago, you'd only have a handful of those logos on that chart. You'd see HP, you'd see a couple of others, um, Intel, but, but most of them are new, and frankly, that, that, pay, that doesn't even begin to show all of the various innovators that are out here in the valley. How did that happen, and how did it happen so quickly? Also, how is it that the United States became such a global digital innovation juggernaut? How is it that, and this is a survey from uh, Booz and Company, uh, that they do every year of the world's most innovative companies. They've been doing this now for several years, about 10 years, I think. And the, this is a two, 2014 result. It shows that nine of the top 10 most innovative global uh, companies are based in the United States. And the majority of them, I think seven of the 10, are involved in either computing software or digital technology. Uh, make a special note of the fact that there are no European companies on the list, which is important for the reason I'm about to state, which is why is it that it's so hard to name any major innovators emanating out of Europe that deal with digital technology or internet, internet technology? Can anybody name one major digital innovator from Europe? I ask this question at a lot of events, and I, I usually don't get too many answers. Um, I, what's that? Okay, so usually I get like an old telecom provider, old cell phone company. but. <laughs> No, that's, that's okay. They, they, they've done a lot of innovation. I wouldn't necessarily call it internet innovation, though, right? It's more telecoms innovation. But, well, here's a snapshot, so let me get into it. You could name Rovio, you could name Skype, you could name Shazam. But if you look at the imbalance compared to the United States in terms of just their market capitalizations, and you just think of all the household names that have come out of the United States over the past 20 to 25 years, it's really completely lopsided. The whole world basically looks to American technology companies and providers for their digital services. The household names here in the Valley are the household names not just across America, but across the globe when it comes to digital technology. So that's got to tell us something, right? Here's another way to look at it. This is probably pretty hard to see on that image, but if you take a look at tech unicorns, these are companies with over a billion dollars in market cap, and you compare them across countries, you see that Apple, Google, and Facebook, each on their own, Dwarf Europe, which is the fourth company or the fourth uh, country, uh, thing listed on there, um, and obviously, if you just take a look at even Airbnb, its value alone is greater than all of Germany's tech unicorns. So these are pretty overwhelmingly lopsided results. And here's just one final look at that comparison. This is a, a list of global public internet companies ranked by market capitalization in 1995 versus 2015. Now, there's two things to notice about this chart, and, and it's very small, so you probably can't read it, but the, the, the bottom line is, is that it used to be the case that there were a, you know, a couple of other competitors to the United States companies. Um, now there are a few still, but they're mostly chi from China, none from Europe. And the other important thing to notice about this is how much churn there is within this list. The only company, I believe, that appears on both sides in 20 years apart is Apple. Everybody else, all the names and faces change. So there's a lot of really dynamic competition or sort of creative destruction of the Schumpeterian variety happening in the digital marketplace. But the bottom line here, uh, as the, the, the title of the site asks, which is, you know, where are the European tech innovators? So there has to be something going on there. But let's put in, introduce one other piece to this uh, puzzle and ask this question. How is it that consumers, from a consumer perspective, have access to all of these types of wonderful digital services at a pretty good price, namely free or dirt cheap? When I was cutting my teeth in the field of regulatory uh, policy 25 years ago, the most important variables that everybody talked about in regulatory textbooks, in, rather regulatory econ or public utility law textbooks, were quantity, quality, and price. And that third one, price, was the most important from a consumer welfare perspective. And all regulatory policy was geared towards getting higher quality, more quantity, lower price. Well, I would argue today, in the digital economy and in the Internet world, we have all of those. We have, we have really an abundance of riches that uh, is really almost unimaginable if you would have asked people 20 years ago if this was possible. So much so that when you talk to regulatory economists or public utility folks today, <clears throat> that's not what they're concerned with. They're concerned with other issues that I'm going to get to in a moment, things like privacy, security, safety, economic disruption, intellectual property. But this is a pretty amazing success story. So I would argue that we have to learn something from these questions that I'm asking, that from the perspective of an economist or a political scientist, what we really care about are natural, real-world experiments that play out in different countries or different continents. That really was what informs us about sort of what's working and what's not in this world. And I think we have a pretty profound uh, uh, um, example here of how the United States has done quite well for itself in this sector where the, the Europeans have really struggled over the past 20 years. So what, what made that happen? 
What was the secret sauce, if you will, that powered the, the digital economy and the internet revolution? We could point to a lot of different factors, I'm sure. We could talk about tax policies or incentives. We could talk about R&D expenditures. We could maybe look at educational institutions or educational backgrounds of people in various sectors. All of those, we could probably find some proof that they contributed to this. But what I'm going to argue here tonight is that what it really comes down to is attitudes and values. Attitudes and values towards innovation and risk taking. And specifically, it comes down to this notion that really came out of the valley of permissionless innovation, a term that I can't take credit for. I wish I could. Nobody really knows who came up with it first. But permissionless innovation generally for, refers to the idea of a general freedom to experiment and learn through trial and error. It's an openness to change and a willingness to adapt to disruption and embrace risk taking and even the possibility of failure which is something that we notice that a lot of countries and cultures, and in fact, most of the European countries, really discourage uh, failure in, in many different ways and don't encourage risk taking. So the bottom line is what I, what I believe and what I've argued in my book and my work is that the United States, by embracing this sort of ethos, this, this vision, this, this attitude towards innovation, and making it the basis of policy, is what fueled the tech revolution that we've seen over the past 15, 20 years. Now, a lot of other people have said this before. I'm not saying anything new. Uh, the economic historian Deirdre Mikulski has written extensively about this, and so has Joel McCurr and many other people, basically noting that values and attitudes matter deeply about uh, innovation. And, and in Deirdre's work, she, uh, she talks about how it affected the Industrial Revolution and says that, quote, a big change in the common opinion about markets and innovation caused the Industrial Revolution and the modern world. The result was economic growth. And all I'm saying by extension, is that the internet is the greatest proof that we have in recent memory of this thesis. That social and political and cultural attitudes towards markets and risk taking and innovation matter and matter profoundly. Now this wasn't always the case. There was a time when the internet was highly permissioned, if you will. This is taken from a textbook that was given to MIT students, engineering students, back in 1982 about the proper use of ARPANET which was the predecessor to the internet. And this was back when the government primarily controlled the internet, or ARPANET as it was called. And this textbook said to students, quote, it is considered illegal to use the ARPANET for anything which is not in direct support of government business. And continued on to saying it would be both antisocial and illegal. And it could get, you in get us in serious trouble with government agencies. So clearly this was a very different attitude. Uh, well, what happened? Well, what happened is, luckily, the Clinton administration came in in the early 90s and made some brilliant decisions. They started by allowing for the commercial opening of the internet in the early 1990s. By 1994, it was fully commercial and open for, uh, for different types of business and just uh, private speech or whatever else you wanted without prior, any sort of prior restraint and permissioning. But secondly, and far more importantly, is the forgotten brilliance of the document that the Clinton administration came out with in 1997 called the Framework for Global Electronic Commerce. It was a very powerfully worded document written by Ira Magaziner, um, and uh, it said, uh, among other things, these are just three of the lead takeaways, that the private sector should lead. The internet should develop as a market-driven arena, not a regulated industry. The government should avoid undue restrictions on electronic commerce. Parties should be free to enter into voluntary negotiations. Where government involvement is needed, it should be, uh, the aim should be to be support a, a predictable, minimalist, consistent, and simple legal environment for commerce. This was our government in 1997 signaling to our companies, our innovators, those who are experimenting with digital technologies that it's okay. You don't need to come to Washington or to a hearing or to an agency and seek prior blessing in order to go out and experiment. And that, I argue, has had profound ramifications. Indeed, the rest is really history because that is really what I believe has contributed to all this innovation we've seen over the last two decades, whereas in Europe they have not embraced that and floundered. By extension, I would argue that there's no reason that what's good, you know, let's, let's make this more applicable. Let's apply this outside the digital context. Let's think about saying what's good for cyberspace must be good for the rest of the economy or good for meat space, if you will. And so I argue in my book that we need to consider applying the same general philosophy or vision to other new tech sectors, technologies, and so on and so forth, with our policy default essentially being innovation allowed. Now, now that doesn't set well with everybody. There are a lot of risks associated with new technologies, and that ultimately leads to calls for certain types of precautionary controls. 
At this point, I need to introduce the idea of the precautionary principle, something many of you probably heard of, emanates out of other sectors, namely environmental law, but it's the general idea that we should craft public policies with an eye towards making sure that innovators can't release new products until they can prove that they won't bring about some sort of harms or disruptions. Uh, it's essentially better to be safe than sorry, is the argument. And that that sort of permissioned approach to, uh, to regulation I again, it's sort of the antithesis of permissionless innovation because it basically says you have to come seek somebody's blessing before you innovate. What are the reasons? What, what drives this sort of precautionary mindset? I argue it comes down to five different things, and I divide all my work uh, at George Mason University uh, on tech policy into sort of these five buckets and then try to figure out which of these is going to apply to various new emerging technologies. First, we have privacy or psychological concerns, or maybe concerns about like uh, digital discrimination, data discrimination, or uh, various types of uh, uh, amorphous psychological harms or reputational harms. That's probably the biggest driver of precautionary proposals today, I would argue. Uh, safety, uh, it's a broad term, but it can be both of a physical nature or a, a mental nature. It can be things like free speech and child safety, or it can be actual physical safety with something like the approval of a new drug or medical device. Third would be security. Security issues can range from thinking things like, you know, can digital systems be hacked? Are there various other types of surveillance concerns, snooping, so on and so forth? That falls into the security bucket. The fourth bucket is really the, the oldest bucket, if you will, when it comes to technological resistance. It's, it's sort of the economic resistance, concerns about uh, machinery, concerns about automation. Uh, those drove concerns of uh, the so-called Luddites who, who pushed back against technology in, in past generations. Um, but it's concerns about job losses or uh, sectoral disruptions or uh, business models. And then fifth, and uh, one that's probably well known to all of you that engenders a whole heck of a lot of controversy and always has for the internet, are the, the many various types of intellectual property concerns raised by digital technology. Um, mostly of a copyright variety, but increasingly patents is a, is a major issue that leads to calls for restrictions on new technologies of a precautionary nature. I'll get, I'll get back to these in just a moment in a little more detail. Now, first I want to outline, well, what's the general problem with permission? And what I've argued in my work is that it comes down to this. The problem with the precautionary principle is that if we spend all of our time living in constant fear of worst-case hypothetical scenarios and then base public policy upon worst-case hy hypotheticals, then best-case scenarios can never come about. That essentially you, you have to be willing to embrace uncertainty and risk if you want wisdom, progress, and prosperity. Because really it's only by engaging in those types of scenarios, risky, risk-taking uh, scenarios, that you can learn and prosper as a people, as a country, as a culture. More specifically, if you, over, if you have overly precautionary types of regulation and innovation, it can obviously mean less opportunities for entrepreneurialism, diminished marketplace competition or new entry. It can result in cronyism uh, from people controlling uh, uh, markets. Um, it can hurt your competitive advantage, as the Europeans, I believe, have, have learned. Um, and it can result for consumers in higher prices, fewer choices, less quality goods. Many people in the Valley obviously agree with this. There's been poll after poll taken, like, what, do you, what are your concerns uh, about policy? And most uh, uh, Silicon Valley insiders poll here taken by the Atlantic reveals government bureaucracy or regulation of technology to be a primary concern, closely followed by immigration policies. But let's take these risks seriously, and I do, because there are really good reasons why we should be concerned about the various emerging technologies that I'm going to discuss here now in more detail. Because, frankly, they do disrupt not just social norms and economic systems and jobs, lifestyles, values, attitudes. It, it affects all of our economy when something like the Internet comes along. I suggest in my work that we should first look to sort of bottom-up solutions before we impose more top-down precautionary preemptive controls. What do I mean by bottom-up solutions? Well, we might consider how we could use educational approaches or transparency efforts technological etiquette efforts about how to properly use devices. We might be able to use empowerment tools. What's an example of an empowerment tool? Something like crypto, uh, encryption. I mean, use crypto to, to better secure your digital devices. We could encourage more self-regulation, uh, industry best practices, codes of conduct. We've done this in many different sectors now for a variety of the technologies I'm discussing here. 
You might consider how contract law or property law might be able to help us with some technologies, whether it's drones or driverless cars or other things like that. You might consider other common law things like product liability norms or uh, product defects law and consider how that can help us solve some of the problems. And then if all else fails, you can consider targeted and limited legal, legal interventions for the truly hard problems that may necessitate something more than these bottom-up approaches. But what I really want to talk about here for a second that I, I've spent a lot of my time working on in, in, in my law review articles is the importance of social adaption to new technologies and the forgotten role of just how good we are as a species in adapting to new technological innovations and how if we give it time and be patient and humble, we'll often see that we can muddle through and find a way to coexist with a lot of these technologies without having to preemptively regulate them. Let me give you the example of the camera, that little picture there, you probably can barely see it. That's a very, very old camera. And when the camera came up, when it was developed in the late 1800s, it was incredibly socially disruptive. If you think about it, you, could, you were able to walk down the road or your path to work or uh, to see a friend and throughout all of human history, and no one could take your image from you. They couldn't just snap it and run. But all of a sudden, a camera came along, and somebody would go, click, and walk away. They could take something from you they never could before. And then, of course, they could be even more intrusive than that. They could take photographs in many different places, places in public. This engendered a lot of controversy. The New York Times uh, railed against so-called Kodak fiends and their, uh, the, the evil things called instant cameras. And the most famous law review article on privacy issues written in American history was written in 1890 by Samuel Warren and Louis Brandeis. Louis Brandeis, who of course went on to be a Supreme Court justice. And they wrote of the, the camera that, quote, instantaneous photographs and newspaper enterprise have invaded the sacred precincts of private and domestic life and numerous mechanical devices threaten to make good the prediction that what is whispered in the closet shall be proclaimed from the housetops. They were so concerned about the camera that they were actually sort of teasing out a way to get around the First Amendment so that they could regulate the camera. Because they understood that, like, th what they were mad about is, in Sam Warren's case is that someone from the Boston Globe had the audacity to come take pictures outside of his daughter's wedding, which was happening in a sort of public location. And he thought that was a gross violation of his privacy. And at that time, it probably was. And so he enlisted Brandeis to write against and rail against the camera and talk about what can we do about this thing. And so there was a lot of hand-wringing. What are we going to do about cameras? What are we going to do about cameras? And soon enough, we had our answer. We were all going to buy one. It became an integral part of the human experience to have a camera in one's home and in one's life. And, and soon enough, we started developing sort of social norms or social uh, etiquette for the proper and improper use of cameras that still is with us to today. I give the example often of every gym I walk into, and there's almost always some sort of a sign somewhere that'll say, no photography in the locker room, right? And if you did try to, if you're walking around with your, you know, your phone and you're taking pictures, somebody's going to slap it down or punch you in the nose, right? Likewise, we develop rough social norms for things like w using a phone in a cinema, right? You either get shushed by everybody or they'll tell you the signage before the movie starts, like please mute or turn off your phones. We've developed norms. That doesn't mean problems don't still exist with cameras. Absolutely, we have problems. We have problems with peeping toms, for example, and, and uh, overzealous paparazzi. And we've developed targeted laws to deal with those troublemakers. But we didn't start with the notion that all cameras should be permissioned preemptively from above by a, you know, a public photography commission, or that every device should be registered and, re and regulated accordingly. We learned how to assimilate these technologies into our life. And what I argue in my work is that this cycle repeats in almost every single technology. You see this sort of initial resistance to a technology, gradual adaptation, and then eventual assimilation. And that usually citizens find creative ways, working together to develop sort of new norms, or new coping mechanisms at least, to deal with various disruptive technologies. If nothing else, greater familiarity with technologies, and maybe just by owning them, breeds more comfort with them. Um, and you could go through all the digital technologies that's come about over the last 15, 20 years and find that cycle repeating. I spent a lot of time in the last decade writing about social networking, for example, which at first people don't remember now, there were efforts to ban social networks or to regulate them or have mandatory age verification. There was a bill called the Deleting Online Predators Act of 2005 that had 410 votes in the House that proposed no social networking be allowed in public libraries. Now, that's kind of unthinkable today. We, we'd kind of laugh that off, but that was legislation. Likewise, when Gmail came out just uh, 12 years ago, there was a bill in this state introduced to ban Gmail, um, even though it was a free resource with unlimited storage and, and offered something that had never been offered before in terms of email capability. 
But the concern was that well, they were serving up ads in a contextual way based upon what was in the content of your messages. And that was sort of, at the time, unthinkable. But sure enough, soon enough, we got used to it. Now over 425 uh, a million people use, use Gmail. So I could go on many, many other examples, but here's another way to think about it. You could think about sort of techno panics or panic cycles about new technologies. This is from a chart that was done by the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. For a paper, they were talking about panic, panic cycles about technology throughout history and says, you know, you always have that sort of initial point of panic and then you reach quickly enough sort of the height of hysteria about a technology, but soon enough, it becomes more commonplace and you reach a point of practicality where you kind of say ho-hum and you move along. And sure enough, I think you can, psych, you, can, uh, you can chart where a lot of technologies sit on this curve today. I don't agree with all their placements here, but you can see, uh, if you can't see it, maybe I'll just uh, read a few off. What are we reaching this sort of like point of panic about today? Well, they talk about gene sequencing and drones. I would argue drones much higher up, more towards the, the height of the panic on drones. Internet of Things, connected, techno connected vehicles, wearable technologies, facial recognition. Uh, behavioral advertising, online advertising, those are the really hot debates right now in Washington and state capitals and around the globe. Um, and the question is, do we start coming back down that other side of the curve and get more acclimation to these technologies and more comfort level the way they argue we have with things like search engine technologies or Google Street View uh, and so on and so forth. I don't know, but it's an interesting way to think about it. So let me try to put this all together in one image, what I've talked about here tonight. The way I like to look at all these debates, talking about the difference between these two visions of permissionless innovation versus the precautionary principle, is to again go back to the idea of thinking about this in sort of a bottom-up and versus a top-down approach. If we start with the precautionary principle at the top here, the, the big red bubble, if you will, then you're thinking about new technologies and how we need to sort of preemptively go out and, and control them. So you might consider some sort of prohibitionary approach it could be a sensorial one, it could be a, a sort of suppressing a technology, it could be flat ban on certain types of technologies. More realistically, in this country, we would adopt sort of anticipatory regulata uh, regulation where you have administrative agencies that would oversee the development of technologies, utilizing administrative mandates and, you know, mandating restrictive defaults on what could be used, how the technology could be used. Uh, it might have a formal licensing procedure. Um, you might have industry guidance, and this is very much the model that a lot of agencies follow today, such as the FDA, the FAA, the FCC, um, NHTSA, and other agencies that are regulating various types of disrupted technologies. They're very much in the anticipatory regulatory mode, trying to, at a minimum, provide industry guidance about how new technology should develop and maybe even consider sometimes a restrictive defaults. In some cases, like in the case of drones and uh, some other things, they consider product bans. Um, now, you could take the opposite approach, the one that obviously I prefer, which is more start at the bottom and work your way up from permissionless innovation as the norm or the policy default. Here you're considering first, like, can we be patient and see how people adapt? Can we see if they will be all right with this thing called 3D printing or this thing called you know, uh, driverless cars or these new advanced medical devices or whatever else. If not, if something more is needing, needed, can we consider how maybe either industry self-regulation or codes of conduct for industry or maybe user empowerment strategies or other types of maybe education and empowerment efforts can help facilitate a better solution and still keep the possibility of innovation uh, alive and thriving. So this is the tension that I argue is affecting all future fights over technology policy. And our choice between these two visions is pretty stark, and it really comes through when you start thinking about some of these things that I've already mentioned. Um, I've done work on all of these bubbles here. You can't see them all, I'll just read a few of them off. But the Internet of Things and wearable tech is, a, is an enormous, uh, exciting space where digital technology is invading the physical world. And there are profound concerns, again, going back to these concerns, privacy, safety, security, economic, and so on, intellectual property. There's profound concerns about how the Internet of Things is basically going to be a giant vacuum cleaner gathering up all this information about ourselves and then get, sharing it with who knows who. And, of course, that's particularly concerning if you go to the bubble just to the right of it of advanced medical technology. I'm sorry, just to the left of it. Um, where you could imagine Internet of Thing technologies like wearable fitness bracelets and other types of things, embeddables and ingestible technologies, being used to gather an enormous amount of data on all of us. 
usually for pretty good reasons, right? I mean, we're trying to figure out, you know, how to, the so-called quantified self-movement, how to better gauge our health, our fitness, our health, uh, our, our vitals, and try to figure out how that data can be put to, put to good use. But you can also consider debates over things like robotics um, and uh, specifically things like driverless cars and uh, drone technologies. I've done a lot of work doing sort of cost-benefit analysis on the benefits associated with both of those things, driverless cars and private drones. I'll just mention the specific debate over driverless cars because I think it's really interesting. We've got so much hard data on cars and the cost of cars to society and the cost of cars specifically in terms of the enormous toll on human life. Every day in this country, 92 people die uh, in a car accident and over 6,500 people are injured. Um, the cost of that, just in the human toll is amazing. And then you have to consider all the other types of costs as well. The bottom line is that if we had more intelligent vehicles or maybe even autonomous vehicle technology, I have to believe those numbers come down and come down radically. Um, the good news is we've seen a fall in traffic fatalities, but it's still a pretty staggering number. But there are concerns about how your driverless cars may operate in a life or death situation. Many of you have heard the so-called trolley problem. And this is a, rages in the philo philosophy uh, world. You know, what happens if you're going down on a trolley, down a track, and another trolley's coming right at you, and you can either go to the left and go off the bridge and kill yourself, or you go to the right and strike some pedestrians and kill them, or you crash right into the trolley and kill everybody on both. What do you do? So it's sort of the no-win scenario. Um, and philosophers have raging debates about this. And they say, well, how are these algorithms for these cars going to be programmed to know how to make the right choice in those scenarios? And before we have driverless cars, shouldn't we figure that out? It sounds reasonable until you realize, by the way, no, 100 people are dying every day on the road because of human error. 6,500 are dying, or I'm sorry, are, are being injured because of human error. We've got a problem right now. So we could talk about how to get perfect algorithms for every possible life and death scenario. That's going to be constantly refined through trial and error. But we shouldn't be stopping these technologies until we get that answer. Likewise, we could talk about drones. There are very profound privacy and security issues and even safety issues associated with drones. Um, I don't want them flying over my backyard. I don't think most of you do either. I, I don't want them snooping in my home. I don't want them crashing down at my head at a ball game, right? On the other hand, I know that the private drone marketplace, which is slowly starting to develop, could have profound societally uh, good impacts by having things like maybe delivery mechanisms. So maybe my grandma, who's very old and can't drive any longer to the pharmacy to get her medicines, can have them delivered from the local uh, pharmacy by a drone. Maybe little small things that people get in cars and get behind a wheel and get in accidents to go out and get can now be easily delivered. Maybe they could be used and are being used right now in search and rescue missions to go out and find people who are missing. A man was just recently found in Texas who is, uh, unfortunately, is very senile and he walked, uh, walked out of his, uh, his nursing care home and, uh, and he was not seen for over 24 hours. They sent out dogs, they sent out people searching, finally they sent up drones to find him, and they did. Technically, every one of those applications I just described, including the search and rescue one, are flatly illegal under current FAA regulations. But clearly they have some profound societal good. And so the debate rages about how to deal with drones. And I could go into many other examples here. I'm doing a paper right now on 3D printing. 3D printing has enormously exciting applications. I just uh, uh, last year went to an incredible conference at John Hopkins University Hospital where I was speaking on a panel with some FDA officials about the regulation of 3D printed prosthetics. And at the conference, volunteers came together and were 3D printing prosthetic hands and arms for children with limb deficiencies. They were doing this on a voluntary basis for something that in the past has cost tens of thousands of dollars for parents to charge, to, to, to pay for new prosthetics. They were getting now free and made custom on the spot by volunteers who said to the kids, what kind of hand do you want? There were kids coming up saying, I want an Iron Man hand, I want a Wolverine hand, and they would do it. I mean, it was incredibly uh, rewarding to see this in, in, in action, this sort of innovation. Um, and the parents were so thankful and the kids were smiling. And then I got on a panel with the FDA official. I'm like, you know, what they're all doing out there is illegal. They didn't go through your phase one, phase two, phase three process of getting medical device approval. Um, they're like, yeah, well, you know, we, we think this is pretty cool. We don't want to mess this up. I'm like, well, wait a minute, but you've got rules, right? You know, what do you think? Are you going to regulate that sector? It's a hard question to know how to answer because clearly you don't want any people, people just skirting the law because there could be bad uses of these devices as well. People might create various types of medical devices or implants that would be harmful to people because they're not regulated. 
An even more profound example involving 3D printing is 3D printed firearms, which if you start researching it, you quickly become a little terrified about the, the kind of arsenals people might be able to amass. And I say this as someone who had uh, guns in their family, and I, I'm not anti-gun, but the reality is, is just anybody with a gun in an unlicensed way raises these questions. If I can print an entire arsenal in my garage, what are the societal impacts of that? How do you regulate that? Do you regulate 3D printers? 3D printers are general purpose technologies. Do you regulate the blueprints for 3D printers? That's free speech. We've got a First Amendment protection to circulate you know, the schematics for how to build a gun. Uh, do you regulate the materials that go into 3D printing to make guns? We're talking about plastics and glue. You know, it, it's really hard to know what the sort of regulatory uh, attack vector is, if you will, for how to get at 3D printing. And then there's virtual reality and augmented reality. And this is something I'm just beginning to research now, and it's really exciting, fun space. But already there are people in the policy world, more specifically in the academy, uh, especially child psychologists, who are deeply concerned about what's going to happen when immersive tech takes off and becomes really wildly popular. Will kids be spending way too much time in it? Will they sort of lose sense of what's real and what's, uh, what's artificial? Will they get addicted to it? And those are legitimate concerns. All I need to do is think about how much time I've spent playing video games for the past 47 years on this planet, and all the time I see my 11-year-old boy spending playing video games and know as soon as virtual reality comes along, he'll be spending all his time there too. So, okay, that's a concern. Again, can we use maybe bottom-up solutions? Can we talk about education? Can we talk about social norms? Can we talk about other ways to solve those problems? Um, I don't know. Um, I haven't even mentioned the sharing economy. In terms of going back to these lists of concerns, in terms of economic disruption concerns, uh, I would think the sharing economy is raising some of the most profound concerns today because what is Uber and Lyft if not two of the biggest lawbreakers in the United States today? And God bless them for it. I think it's great that they've gone out there and carved out a new, innovative, uh, competitive way of, of, of offering ride-sharing services uh, from a stodgy sector that needed to be sh you know, shaken up a little bit. But let's be clear, they're not playing by the same rules as the taxi cab companies are, or the limo drivers. So there's a profound, unlevel playing field problem we have there. How do we level that proverbial playing field? Do we do it by regulating up to make sure everybody's on the same level playing field as the old taxis and limos? Or do we deregulate down to make sure everybody looks more like Uber and Lyft? That's, again, precautionary principle versus permissionless innovation at work. Cryptography, uh, obviously, there's a raging debate happening in this country right now about the, the regulation of cryptography. This has been going on for 20 years. I thought we had sort of won the crypto wars and put them to bed, but they're right back here in front of us again. And we're wondering, well, should tech companies have some sort of process where their cryptography products are somehow permissioned or regulated or we have a backdoor key to it as a government official? Or Bitcoin, right? You really want to talk about something that can shake things up, you know, government control of money is something that's always been sort of at the, one of the root uh, powers of government. And all of a sudden things like Bitcoin come along and dark markets and other ways to evade traditional monetary uh, controls um, and the profound implications are pretty clear. The bubble here that I'm spending most of my time on these days is the advanced medical technology bubble. I think this is where the most interesting fight between permissionless innovation and precautionary principle comes out because you have in this country the Food and Drug Administration, which is probably the most heavily precautionary principle-oriented agency in the United States, and in some cases for good reason, because they're concerned about the, the safety of drugs and medical devices. But then again, you think about the flight of 23andMe. Many of you know about this, genetic testing by mail. 99 bucks, get a complete genetic readout. Incredible sort of democratization of sort of genetic testing. What did the FDA do? They sent them a nasty gram saying, you better stop this, we're gonna come down hard on you. What did 23andMe do? They went to England and started marketing it there, where the British opened up their, opened up their doors and said, come over here, you can do that here instead. It's an example of what I call global innovation arbitrage. So one of my next papers is talking about all the different ways jurisdictions are competing for innovators the same way in the past they competed for capital. You're seeing it happen in a profound way with drones, driverless cars, and advanced medical tech. But the really, really crazy cool stuff happening in advanced medical tech is happening in the world of embeddables and ingestibles and biohacking, where average citizens are coming together and finding ways to modify their own abilities, their own bodies, to add certain types of things, features to their body, or to correct certain types of problems. I'm not kidding, go to, a, go to biohack.me and check out the freak show that that site is with all the videos shared of people doing things like planting, implanting magnets and cutting open their fingers and putting magnets in their fingers. Putting cell phone conduction technology in their ears so they can take their calls uh, and their bones ring in the back of their ear and you can hear it without even having a device. People are doing this right now. 
it's not ready for prime time, and there's a huge number of dangers, but it, it came out of the body modification world and the world of tattoos and so on and so forth. People started putting embedded studs and things on their skin. Then people realized we can put technology in our bodies. And already today there are things that are FDA approved, uh, like the, the colon cam pill that you can swallow instead of having a colonoscopy, you can just swallow a pill. And believe me, it's a lot better than the opposite. <laughs> and, and that is an FDA approved device. But what happens in a world where those devices are increasingly decentralized? Who knows, maybe they're made at home. And we essentially, de we get a sort of de facto right to try, if you will, all sorts of new drugs and medical devices. Of course, we already know this is how the world's unfolding because of these things. I, I don't think this is really a, s a smartphone anymore. This is more like a mobile medical device for me right now. I did a run around campus today and monitored it all on here. This device came with eight different health and fitness apps, preloaded, by the way. It measures all my steps, gives me sorts of d different types of uh, predictions about, you know, how many steps I'll take each day. I can even get more sophisticated devices and apps for these phones that will tell me how my heartbeat's doing, which is something I just put my thumb on here to do, and so on and so forth. Pretty soon we're going to be able to go, and we're going to get a complete genetic history, right? I hope I wouldn't have to lick it because that'll be gross. But the bottom line is, is that that's the world that's emerging, and it radically upends the traditional regulatory process, which has been highly permissioned, highly precautionary at the FDA for many, many decades. And so in a paper that I'm about to release, I talk about this world of sort of the de facto right to try that's emerging for new uh, disruptive technologies. And I say, what are we going to do about that world? Because in some cases, I'm, I'm not running around saying, it's all going to be sunshine and roses, everything will be great. No, 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 people are going to make a lot of stupid decisions when you have a fully democratized, decentralized ability to essentially prescribe for yourself or do other things for your body, modify your body in, in strange ways. Um, but we don't want to take away that authority because they might be doing it for beneficial purposes, like the 3D printed prosthetics example I just gave, right? And there are many other examples like that. What we're going to have to do, I argue in my paper, is we're going to have to get serious, far more serious about risk education. We need our government, we need the FDA and others to get serious about telling people like, look, we understand you might be able to do this with these devices. These new emerging technologies give you these capabilities to do it without our permission. But you'd better understand the risks associated with it. The FDA does this right now. They have a risk education uh, division and, and a set of efforts, but they don't plow many resources into it. They're too busy thinking about how to take the thou shall not approach or the mother may I approach of saying, come here and get our permission first. And that works when you have large intermediaries. When you have somebody like 23andMe, who's on the cover of Fortune, or Forbes, you could say, okay, well, we know who to go after, and their headquarters are in New York, send them the nasty gram, right? And they go in there and they could sue them. But when it's average Americans doing this in their homes or their garages or in a collaborative way online, it's much, much harder to know how to, how to control that activity. And so I'm arguing that regulators need to con consider changing their approach. So the bottom line is, and I'll leave you with this, you're not going to be able to see this on this television. This chart sits on my wall at work. It lists all the technologies that I just identified, and it lists all the various types of policy concerns that I've discussed. So at the top axis, you have privacy, safety, security, economic disruption, intellectual property. On the other axis, you have all of these different technologies. And then the small numbers that you can't see are basically the efforts of my colleagues and I at George Mason's uh, Mercatus Center to try to put some weights on what we think is the primary policy concern in each area. For something like the Internet of Things or Big Data, clearly it's privacy that's a driver of policy concern. But for something like, say, robotics or driverless cars, it's more of a safety concern, right? Um, and clearly for other issues like uh, uh, 3D printing, it could be something more like intellectual property would be a concern, about things you could rip off, but it could also be safety. So the, the bottom line is don't get too hung up on the weights or the numbers. What I want to communicate with you with this, with this chart and with this talk more generally, and, and I'll close on this to take questions, is that this is opportunity knocking. These are research opportunities. These are things that are sort of greenfield opportunities for you to go out and write interesting papers from the perspective of economics, law and economics, public policy, economic history, psychology. I mean, every potential discipline can be brought to bear on these issues. And I'm telling you, there's just not much of a literature on any of them. So if you're interested, let me know. I'm happy to talk to you or advise you on products, or projects, rather. Um, I advise and mentor a lot of students in, in my program uh, at Mercatus. Um, I try to give them ideas for things they could write about. But I think you can sort of see, as I've sort of teased out some of these concerns uh, over the last couple of minutes, that the sky's the limit. 
you know, these are great, fun products to be writing about. They're provocative issues, uh, and I hope you're interested, and I hope you do read the book. Second edition will be out uh, end of next month, uh, and at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. I believe Jack's got a microphone, and he's going to bring that around. So, Jack, I'll let you kind of rove around. I mean, we've got one up here, and there's one back there. Let's okay. Go. So, if you just hold up your hand, I'll kind of keep track of who it is, and uh, I'll get to you. Thank you. Tell me your name so I know who I'm talking to. Hi. My name is Megan. My question to you is, uh, is since we were talking about intellectual poverty, uh, would you sometimes, and, some, and this is just an example, one of the things I... Uh, that um, a company called Newegg does is they um, have a, a large uh, fund to uh, attack patent trolls because uh, recently they've been attacked by people who, who are making claims about certain patents like crypt encryption was one of them and they had professionally brought it into a person who wrote the code who said it was open source but, um, but then there was a bad interpretation of the law so do you think that these ragged mother, mother may I don't actually own see their own faults with their own laws and that's the problem with sometimes that, that falls with the top-down solutions. Yeah, well, it's important to realize that when it comes to intellectual property, we already have a very obviously permissioned approach to, uh, to the regulation of a lot of technologies. And this has been the raging wars over online music and Napster and everything that followed. Um, and now with patents, you have a similar issue. Uh, I'm sort of a, I'm in the mushy middle of the IP wars. And uh, I wrote a book, uh, a lengthy book, uh, in 2002 uh, called Copy Fights, uh, all about these debates. And I got so much grief from both sides for trying to be a peacemaker that I promptly left the field of intellectual property and said, I'm not coming back. So that's just to tell you, I don't probably have a very good answer to your question, even though it's a very good one. Um, but on the patent front, I, I think there's a lot of agreement now, a lot of agreement, not just out here in the Valley, but across America, um, that we've got a real problem with, uh, with patents, and specifically uh, business method patents. Uh, software patents and so on and so forth. There's real questions about the extent of, of those laws and how they might deter innovation. Uh, I'm convinced that there needs to be something done about that problem. There's been court cases and this is raged. Um, I don't think we should undo patents entirely, but we do have to have some restraints on, on, on them. I don't know much about the new egg situation, so I apologize. Um, and I don't think I've answered your question, but that's probably the best I've got. I'm sorry. There's a question back there. Oh, uh, my question to you is, uh, <clears throat> in terms of the uh, of the commerce thing, um, in terms of uh, how a regulation uh, will affect it, uh, I actually read a book uh, this morning in regards uh, t to this case. Okay, and uh, it's talking about um, how exactly uh, the government should uh, should regulate uh, e-commerce and um, <clears throat> like how to avoid fraud, how to avoid um, how to avoid <clears throat> or how to avoid say you know to avoid people from, say, stealing your credit card, or um, <clears throat> how do you think uh, the government should, um, should, take o should, affect, should regulate uh, e-commerce effectively when, w w when nowadays you can make transactions uh, on Facebook, monetary transactions? Yeah, well, it depends on the specific issue. We're at the point now with e-commerce, you have to drill down a little bit about specifically what we'd like to see the government regulate and not regulate. I think there are very legitimate concerns about the cybersecurity of a lot of our digital systems, and especially as we move to an even more fully interconnected world of the so-called Internet of Things, there's very legitimate concerns about the vulnerabilities associated with our digital systems. Um, I think what the government has been doing has been really smart in terms of encouraging so-called greater privacy by design and security by design efforts, sort of the idea of baking in good privacy and security practices from the start. Now, that's not, it's different from mandating them from the start or having federal standards or security standards or privacy standards. That's probably more the European approach that they've tried and it hasn't worked out so well. You want to have flexibility within this process, but I don't have a problem with the government basically saying, and this has been done mostly by the federal, U.S. Federal Trade Commission, that here are some best practices or a code that people should follow. And they bring together various stakeholders and have a so-called multi-stakeholder process, various players in the field who are interested in digital security or digital privacy. They say, how can we hammer out some good best practices about things like notice, choice, other things that you might be concerned with, consent, and then apply them more broadly. And then what the Federal Trade Commission does is, is if companies agree to abide by those sorts of standards, and then they later don't live up to the promises they've made to the consumers, the FTC can come back and say, you are engaged in unfair and deceptive trade practices, and we're going to essentially fine you under Section 5 of the FTC Act. 
I think that's a pretty decent framework. I think the FTC can go overboard with it, and times has. But right now, the FTC has frameworks like this for online advertising, for biometrics. There's a process like this going through a, the, an agency called the NTA for drones. Um, we have a process like this uh, uh, for Internet of Things, for wearables, for medical devices. The FDA is also increasingly utilizing the same sort of model of sort of industry guidance. Here's the one other downside to keep in mind. It's a flexible, more flexible process than the traditional more command and control precautionary approach, but it's also a slightly more arbitrary one. So there's a real tension here because I'm somebody who's a big believer in the rule of law and like, you know, if you're going to have rules, make them clear. But the problem with that is I don't want to have really, really clear rules that stop all innovation. <laughs> I would rather have a somewhat more flexible approach of sort of industry codes of conduct and best practices that evolves over time. The only problem is, is that sometimes companies don't know what they're in violation of. Because, and they don't even know if they formally agreed to it. Maybe Apple and Google and Facebook sat at that table in, you know, 2015 and agreed to something. But what about the innovator in the garage right now is just developing and is going to put a product in the market this year? Did they abide by the best practices that were set down by these companies and these agencies working together? I don't have a good answer to that. that that's a real tension for in, the, in the field of law and economics. Uh, I, I lost you. Oh, there. Uh, thank you for the lecture. Um, it's very good. Um, and I wanted to ask you uh, for your ideas on 3D printing. Like, um, if you had to, if, if a legislator had to go out of the way to find a way to prevent people from being able to make a gun on a 3D printing device for whatever reason, or a weapon, or anything of that nature, um, what is some of the, ve like you mentioned, there are some vectors that you go about doing it, like the materials and other things, and um, uh, there might be ways of getting around that, but what is a, a most realistic vector that politicians are looking at to kind of prevent people from being able to make weapons or any other harmful yeah. devices well, with uh, 3D printers? Good question. Well, they, they usually, after they go through the same of concerns or issues that I went through in terms of the troubles of how do you regulate, you know, I can't regulate the materials, I can't regulate the general purpose technology itself, you can't license it probably, um, you can't regulate the blueprints. After you go on down the list, you realize, well, what we're left with is some sort of use-based regulation where you say, we're not going to try to preemptively regulate that technology based on this concern. Instead, we're going to wait and see how it's used and then go after the end users who use it in an appropriate way. Now, that's not always optimal. Because some people would like to see some of those uses, specifically firearms, controlled preemptively and strictly licensed. And after you've created your own 3D printed gun, we can have a law that says you should license it as if it's any other firearm. But I don't know if everybody will. Um, people can right now in their own homes build guns using wood and metal and other things. And they don't have to necessarily go through that same process. But if they go out and commit a crime with it, it's still a crime, right? So you still have a way to regulate use. And this is a big part of the debate that rages in a lot of these fields I've discussed, which is like, do you try uh, to regulate for the, con you know, the, the product based on the conceivable fear or harm, or do you based on, on use cases and say, these are the things you will not do with this technology. Even if we can't control it preemptively, later on if you do this, you know, your butt's going to be in the grinder. Uh, you're going to go to jail for a long time or whatever. And I ultimately think that's probably how it has to be. Um, and uh, I don't know how, it'll, how well it'll work. Uh, again, it won't be just attention for firearms, but the medical devices, it's going to be an enormous tension. And then in the field of intellectual property, there's a lot of toy manufacturers who right now want to see 3D printers somehow regulated because of the fear that basically a kid will get his Christmas list, give it to mom or dad, and they'll run down to their printer and just make it. Right? I don't know. That's not happening right now, but it could happen in the future. And it certainly could happen for other technologies. You know, I, I mentioned the genetic uh, sequencing, genetic testing thing. You know, ten years, I was just reading a book, great new book by Dr. Eric Topol called The Patient Will See You Now, wonderful play on words, basically saying patient empowerment means like no longer are the doctors in control and medical paternalism is going away. And he talks about the medical revolution that's happening with the smartphones and digital technologies. And he points out that 10 years ago, the cost to sequence a genome was in the tens of millions of dollars. Today, a few years ago, it was in the thousands of dollars. Now it's moving down to the hundreds of dollars. In another 10 years, it'll be pennies. And at that point, I don't know how you stop it, especially if it's... Somebody can put an app on here, and you can do it, right? But you can say that if you then develop an app and you make it easy for people to do genetic sequencing or testing or whatever themselves, and they later do something stupid based on that information or harm themselves, you're liable for that, right? That might develop under common law anyway. We have a very litigious society in America, if you haven't noticed. I mean, that's something you know, people sue at the first notice of anything pro going wrong. So maybe that's solved through the common law anyway. We'll see. I know Lydia has a question, and is there one over there?
has to bring it to me first. Mm. <laughs> um, so you mentioned the, the legal infrastructure that we're inheriting. Um, and I see that as actually stopping a lot of very small ground up uh, innovation because you have to have uh, deep pockets mm -hmm. to weather crazy uh, class action lawsuits. I mean, to think about somebody other than Google or Apple coming up with the driverless car, you, it's not something a small firm could even think of doing because the first accident would wipe them out. Yep, that's uh, right. That. A, lot, a lot of companies so, are eating through their VC money just like defending themselves in courts of law. So what can we do to um, change that infrastructure <laughs> to make uh, innovation more uh, fluid? Well, I'm not here to give a lecture on the problems with American tort law, but I will say if we had a loser pays world, we'd be in a better world. Um, we don't have that. We need that. We have a perverse incentive to file, file, file and frivolous lawsuits can go forward without any sort of cost. So we have perverse incentives that ultimately lead to bad results from a law and economics perspective. Um, this has always been a problem for those of us who favor common law based solutions over administrative regulation solutions because ultimately some of those common law solutions can be actually more expensive than in, you know, putting up with a preemptive regulatory regime. Um, there are other potential fixes. There are ways to possibly deal with this. Uh, I just pitched an, uh, an op-ed to the Wall Street Journal that was unfortunately rejected, but a colleague and I um, have got this idea of coming up with a, we need an innovator's defense fund. We need to have people come together and support the small uh, innovators, not the Googles and the Facebooks and the Apple. They've got plenty of resources to defend themselves in court. The, the people who are just getting started that you mentioned, when they come up against the regulatory juggernaut that is maybe the FDA or the FAA or whomever else and have a new innovative product design or idea that they want to market but they're finding themselves with their butts in the, in the grinder from, uh, from this unwanted regulatory attention. Who defends them in court? Ultimately nobody. They usually go under. A lot of them, like I said, burn through their VC money defending themselves and then they're just, they move on. So uh, I'd like to see, you know, uh, various philanthropists come together who are interested in, in you know, pushing forward with uh, new innovative ideas and say, let's find a way to defend these folks and have some sort of a public interest law fund uh, or, or, or legal sys uh, body that basically defends uh, innovators like that. And I've, I have a litany of cases I could give them right now. Uh, small people, average folks will call me up and say, uh, I'm using drones for wedding photography and I got this nasty letter from the FAA. What do I do? I said, dude, not, I'm not a lawyer. I'm, not, I'm definitely not going to be law your lawyer because you're in real trouble here. But uh, it, it's, a, it's a legitimate, le legitimate question, right? Th th there's a rise in wedding photography using drones. It's all illegal. But people are doing it. People are advertising. And, you know, and it, those people need to be defended because I, I think they've got a pretty cool product, pretty good idea. But the FAA is going to come down on them hard and they know they can break them. So, anyway. Uh, other questions? Oh, right back here. So, um, I think something that was missing tonight was some type of public choice perspective on why bureaucrats want to control things or control markets and then you mentioned just now you know why do toy manufacturers want to stop innovation because they're trying to protect uh, certain interests and so forth so I think um, you know my impression is is that most bureaucrats want to protect turf and if there's a new turf they can take on, such as like Airbnb, mm -hmm. they'll say, hey, that's a part of my control and let's do it yeah. and so forth. And great, so I think great point. a lot of this is counterproductive uh, to some extent. Um, and, you know, this whole thing on safety and protection is, is usually an excuse to expand um, sure. control. Amen. Yeah, yeah, you're, uh, you're you're preaching my usual gospel. I mean, coming from George Mason University, they do sort of the home of public choice, if you will. Uh, I, I totally agree with that, those concerns. Um, and we clearly see that in a major way in the sharing economy, as you mentioned. Uh, what's happening at the state and local level is in, in terms of a lot of entrenched interest and regulators working together to sort of keep out new, new innovators. It's really, really troubling. Um, but I don't want to make that the totality, the, the whole story. I don't want to make it all about public choice. And public choice can't explain everything. I mean, I, me, I meet with a lot of regulators on a, on a regular basis. And certainly some of them are there to preserve their own power and grow their own budgets, the typical public choice story. And some of them are maybe even too close to incumbents. That's uh, the most concerning. But a lot of them have legitimate, heartfelt concern about the ramifications of new technologies. And what I state in my book is that I'm, I'm going to take those seriously. I'm going to take their concerns about privacy, safety, and security seriously, even if I have a jaded perspective in the back of my head that's saying, are they not just doing this for the so-and-so or such and such an interest? Maybe they are, but I want to engage 
on their concerns, on the merits of them, and say, let's take them seriously, because eventually this could become a serious problem that will thwart innovation in this field, um, even if there is a public choice story that really is behind it. But there's plenty of work to be done on that topic, and sh clearly the sharing economy is probably one of the best examples of that. You want another good one, go take a look at all the efforts to regulate Bitcoin, and take a look at how some of traditional banks and others are trying to regulate, are trying to get traditional financial regulations imposed on people who are like doing interesting emerging things with uh, Bitcoin or digital, digital uh, c uh, cash. I mean, that's clearly a public choice story going on there. And there's a little bit of that going on with the FAA and drones, where pilots and others who are usually, you know, fighting with the FAA over regulation will say, oh, we love the FAA, but just p go and pose it all on the drone guys, right? You always can find a story like that, right? But behind every one of them, there's always something else lurking that you need to be paying attention to. The safety of drones, the security of sharing economy, the security of Bitcoin. Legitimate concerns. I don't see any other hands right now that, oh, I, I spoke too soon. Mm -hmm. I guess I don't know how to quite frame this as a question, which is my fault, but one of the things that I observe out of this discussion is if we want to be free people in a free and open society, uh, with that comes this, the usual admonition to take responsibility for that freedom and not do stupid things or be held self-accountable for those stupid things that we do. And it does seem to me that an open, permissionless society, even with, its, even with the fear, uh, it leads, to more, leads to more accountability and responsibility on the part of individuals. And, and it, it tends to resonate with me, at least, that, that uh, and I've seen this a little bit in local government, that uh, if, you, if the government tells us what to do, we stop thinking for ourselves about what we ought to do, and we stop doing things like parenting our children because someone else is going to do it for us. And so it, it does seem to me there's a value it, to liberty-minded people to keep things free and open, even if there are costs associated with it, because we'll learn from it that way, and we'll stop doing stupid things with it that way. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, I agree with all that. Uh, a chapter I have coming out in a book on behavioral economics is about the importance of failure to human learning and prosperity. And I, I go and I find all these different disciplines where the importance of failure has been discussed, from structural engineering to child psychology and child development to other s fields. And I find all these wonderful stories about how human learning is somehow stunted because of preemptive or cautionary controls. My favorite example from, I mean, in the field of structural engineering, there's plenty of examples like this, but in the field of child psychology, I found some amazing literature um, from some Scandinavian researchers about all of the restrictions and regulations that came into place over the past 20 years for playground safety. And how uh, some of you may be old enough to remember, but I, I, I'm getting close to 50. So, I mean, when I was a kid, there were really tall jungle gyms you could climb and all sorts of climbing structures and there weren't a lot of re regulations about it. And if you fell, yeah, you were going to get hurt. You maybe break something, but you know, you'd learn from it, right? And then all of a sudden, they started going away. And then all of a sudden, high dives at swimming pools started going away. And you just had low dives. In some cases, now you have no dives. You just dive off the edge. You no longer even get a diving board. And a lot of this was driven not necessarily by regulation, but what Lydia got to, which were tra trial lawyers coming and suing whenever there was an accident. So one by one, they all started coming down or getting lower playground equipment and, and diving boards. So these Scandinavian researchers looked into this and say, are we safer and better off because of restrictions on these tall climbing structures? And they said no for a number of reasons. One of the most obvious ones is that with less climbing and less activity, you have a more sedentary lifestyle and there's other problems that develop when you're less active as a child. So you have to consider factor that in. But the most amazing result they found is how inexperience with tall climbing structures or high dives led to later phobias in life about fears of climbing or heights. And they documented this. And I said, this is really remarkable, because what they're pointing out is that a little risk uh, and some failure is good for us. And we, you know, by infant, you know, treating us like infants, ultimately later in life, we'll still be like them. 
And there's a real danger associated with that for a culture when you start extrapolating that out to other contexts. And so I wrote this chapter basically documenting all the, all the benefits, if you will, of failing. And uh, you, know, you find all these great things even written by like playwrights. I think it was Samuel Beckett who says, uh, ever fail no matter, fail better, fail often, or something like that. And it was basically saying you learn from it. And you remember Einstein's famous quote about his 10,000 10, failed light bulb experiments. When a journalist asked him about it, I said, well, sir, what about your, your 10,000 failures? And he says, I have not failed 10,000 times. I have succeeded 10,000 times in finding what will not work, and I'm about to find the one that will. He learned from every one of them, right? So that, and, and in my new edition of Permissionless Innovation, I've got a huge expanded section on how this plays out on the ground in Europe. I, I, it probably seems like I'm picking on the Europeans, and I, well, I kind of am. But uh, there's a real cultural, attitudinal difference between the way the Europeans look at innovation versus Americans. And it's really interesting to go to conferences as I do in Europe or listen to speeches or, or read papers and books and, and realize that they talk a big game about innovation, but as soon as you talk about how it sh you know, shakes up societal values or economic systems or support mechanisms or whatever, they're like, well, we can't have that. And then you say, well, some of these larger, older, established firms or professions will fail. We can't have that. But we still want innovation. And you're like, you could just go down the list. <laughs> no, you don't want innovation. You really don't. You don't. You're so afraid of failure. And this comes out in numerous contexts, but uh, I think there's power to what you stated in terms of what it means for a free and prosperous society to embrace a little bit of risk and failure and learn and prosper from it. So I'm just curious, do you see any pushback uh, in Europe when you talk to people, particularly younger people in Europe, about this sort of this attitude about failure? We have some students who come from Europe here and we talk about it in class and there seems to be a much more receptive than maybe the generation before. Perhaps, I think it depends on the issue. What are we talking about in terms of the risks or the failure that we're talking about? I think uh, there's, there's more of a willingness to embrace the idea that certain types of sectoral pr protections or profession, protections for professions or skills are going to have to adapt. You just can't live with those kind of systems forever in, in a world where global innovation arbitrage is possible. I mean, there's a reason why all of most of Europeans' best digital minds came here and innovated here and got their VC money here. And there's a reason you can't find VC money in Europe. You can find some, but not a lot, because they're not going to invest there. But if you're talking about different values or different things that will be disrupted, if you're talking about privacy, it's a non-starter with a European audience, because privacy is regarded there as a dignity right, a fundamental human right that is not just equal to like free speech, but in many ways trumps it. Whereas on this side of the Atlantic, we take a, a stronger view of the importance of speech and privacy isn't treated as a dignity right, but as an important value that we try to preserve in other ways. And that transatlantic clash of visions is really profound. It's driving, many of you may have heard, the huge fight that's underway right now uh, between the U.S. and the Europeans about the so-called safe harbor uh, and the idea of like digital data transfers between American tech companies for doing business in Europe back here to the States. Some of it's a very legitimate concern. Europeans concerned about the U.S. surveillance state and about overzealous spying. Of course, they're spying too. They just don't like to talk about it. But they feel they have better protections there against that sort of surveillance than we do here. They might be right. I don't know. Um, they also make a very good point, which is that I always try to make the point that like data collection for purposes of commercial opportunities, like giving you better search engines and better email and better advertising, or whatever, that's just basically making better products. It shouldn't be restricted. Um, you know, and it doesn't have the same privacy ramifications as, say, a government surveillance state kind of mandate that try to snoops on all your data and collects it all because obviously governments can fine you, imprison you, you know, whatever else, whereas private companies can't. But their retort is a good one in Europe, which is that the problem is the infrastructure that the private companies have created facilitates the surveillance state and ultimately they just backdoor everything, right? And they're probably right, right? So what do we do? Do we give up all of our wonderful big data applications and all of our digital technologies that gather all this information because of a concern about how the state might use it? Or do we try to get state surveillance under control? It's proving to be really hard to do that, especially when they're lying to us about what they're actually doing, right? I think there's a question over here, uh, by the way. Yeah, 
Yeah, this is a bit more of a playful question. Um, of the technological disruptions that you listed, you left out a pretty big one, which may not be as advanced, and that's uh, AI mm -hmm. or artificial intelligence. I was wondering, does the precautionary principle uh, kind of have greater weight in this area, especially given how fearful a lot of the biggest names in tech are of AI? Yeah, great question. Uh, it's only briefly mentioned there in the big red bubble there uh, uh, under uh, robotics and stuff, but I, I should give it more attention in my talk. It's, it's, it's a big issue. Uh, it's potentially a very concerning one. I, it's, you've probably heard of the investments that are being made by Elon Musk and others in terms of doing more research on this. And you know, the, the question of sort of what are, what's now being discussed in the emerging field of robot ethics uh, are really profound and interesting ones about like how much intelligence do we want to have in non-humans and artificial devices? Um, and will we be their master or will they master us? You know, and of course, Every discussion about this is just dripping with dystopian dread and like sci-fi scenarios about either Terminator or Gattaca or 1984, you know. So uh, I get it. Uh, those are legitimate concerns. There may be a better cause there for some preemptive like policies. In my book, I talk about when does precaution make sense, the new expanded edition of my book. I have a whole section about like, okay, aren't there some scenarios where precaution makes sense? And I say basically it comes down to scenarios where you have the potential for immediate, irreversible, catastrophic harm. We, for example, do not allow the possession of uranium in this country. We do not allow people to carry bazookas down the road or roll them down the street in tanks, right? Immediate, irreversible, catastrophic harm could come from the use of those technologies. Is artificial intelligence equal to those? Hmm. I don't know. It depends on how you define artificial intelligence too, right? I'll tell you another er challenging area. I, I mentioned... Uh, genome issues. Um, I did not get into all of the different kinds of things having to do with genetic enhancement and the potential for interesting types of experimentation with your own children. And think about all the things people will be able to do in the coming years now that we can sequence genomes to address very legitimate problems that might develop in terms of like diseases or things you might want to address while the child's in the womb. But also think about all the parents that will engage in what we now are calling designer babies. Right? They'll say, I really want my kid, and I, this would have been true of me, I'm a huge basketball fanatic, I really would like my kid to be good at basketball. He's every bit as bad, it turns out, as I was. I hope I wouldn't have been like tinkering with him when he was in mom's womb, but you can imagine that some parents might want to do exactly that. Right? And we're talking about what it means to be human in that case. There are probably some good reasons to have some guidelines before we develop, to use another dystopian sci-fi story, a Frankenstein monster problem, <laughs> right? Um, there's even, uh, maybe if you've heard the term uh, save your sibling, the idea of having a second child that can basically be used to harvest organs for another child if they get ill. Um, you know, this affects the relations between generations and the nature of our humanity. It's a totally different thing, in my opinion, than most of the technologies I'm discussing here. Um, and AI might qualify for that. So, yeah, I agree. There are, there are times when the concern is raised a, a, a notch. I still don't want to see all innovation, all research shut down on those fronts, though, right? We have some people, including many conservatives, who want to stop all stem cell research, even though it could lead to a lot of things I just discussed. But think of all the benefits of stem cell research. It's incredible what's being done right now thanks to that. So, wait, I have have one quick Lydia's question. Lydia's got the mic. Again. <laughs> so um, this question uh, reminded me of what environmental studies students talk a lot about, the tipping point. If you get past the, the edge of reproduction, you've lost a species. And that might be the problem with AI. Uh, and I'm not sure that a tipping point exists, but we think it does. You know, at some point, the machines take over and we can't stop them anymore yeah. uh, on that. So I guess a research that looks into whether or not there is legitimacy for that tipping point yep. fear would be uh, something. Absolutely. Uh, there's a lot of books being written about these different technologies by philosophers, ethicists, lawyers. It's a book by, the, probably the best of these is out, uh, it's called A Dangerous Master by Wendell Wallach, who's mm -hmm. a Yale bioethicist. I'm going to be debating him at a Microsoft event in a couple of months, and I'm hoping to do some other debates with him. He's, it's a really thoughtful book about a lot of these technologies, but specifically uh, genome and bioethic technologies. Um, and he has, takes a more sort of pessimistic perspective and one that calls for more precaution in many of these cases than I would. Um, but he doesn't really answer that question because it's a really hard thing to answer when you get to the tipping point. By the way, there's a, there's a term for this. It's called the Collingridge Dilemma. 
1980, there was a book written by David Collinridge. I think he was a British sociologist. Um, and it was called The Social Control of Technology. And he said, there comes a point when you work your way up a curve of adoption, like the curve I showed before, where you just can't put the genie back in the bottle because people get either so familiar with it and want more of it, or because the technology just sort of has a mind of its own, just like you can't control it. And, he's, and he was arguing, we need to do everything we can to stop it from getting to that point, whatever that inflection point is, or even close to it. But didn't really offer a clear blueprint for how to do it without ultimately shutting down all the benefits associated with it. Remember, going back to the tagline, my key thesis in my book, if you spend all your time obsessing about hypothetical worst case scenarios and basing public policy on it, you don't get any best case scenarios either. And every one of these things we've talked about, genome testing, robotics, AI, Internet of Things, whatever, you know, yeah, risks exist, but if you try to sort of preemptively, precautionarily stop all of these things, say we only want the good, <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to know how to do that. Um, ultimately, I, I, the question I answered earlier for the gentleman back there when I said, you know, codes of conduct, self-regulation, guidance documents, I think that's going to become the primary, the primary mechanism by which we do this. And what a lot of ethicists and a lot of philosophers are now recommending is the idea of data ethicists or algorithmic um, philosophers, if you will, people who will sit in these companies and help make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis about like, yeah, sure, you could code this to do that or build this to do that, but would that be ethical, you know, would that be smart? And like offer them some perspectives on what would be the downside. Now, I don't want that mandated by law, or that becomes a major sort of veto on all innovation. But I also don't want to rule out the idea that having ethical philosophers in AI shops is a bad idea. I mean, it may help them sort through these. I, the same way I want to see more economists in these shops to think through the, like, the economic trade-offs associated with certain things. Right now, they just have lawyers, 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 right? And not a lot of these other professions. Yes, sir. And I have the mic, but the button? Yeah, it's on. Oh, all right. Uh, often the new innovation comes in and competes with an existing technology that is, or existing market, that is subject to an existing tax and regulatory policy. And presumably we don't want the policy to bias the selection of the new or the old technology. So. People have talked about this with Uber. Do the yep. drivers get workman's comp? That, could you speak to that issue? Sure, sure. It goes back to that proverbial level playing field problem, right, that I talked about. And how do you, how do you level it? How do, how do you get regulatory parity is what we call it in the field of regulatory economics. Because, you know, all, all other things being equal, we do want to have similarly situated competitors being regulated the same way. But sometimes not all things are equal. Sometimes you have a real problem, which is that you have existing institutions regulated one way for one reason and then you have the new disruptors. I'll give you an example. I mean, when I stay at a hotel, there is just reams of regulations that cover hotel safety. And of course, there's a whole boatload of taxes. Most of those don't cover Airbnb. Now, what do we want to do about that to get regulatory equality? I will tell you this, the FTC recently had a workshop that I testified at on the sharing economy and it was inundated with average Americans many of whom were elderly, who talked about the amazing success story of Airbnb in terms of how it allowed them, when they were on fixed incomes, to supplement it by renting out their basement, their attic, their back shed or whatever. Um, and they never had that before. And all of a sudden, they were able to supplement their fixed incomes. It just one letter after the next. And I thought, this is amazing. And so when I was testifying, I said, do we think that those average you know, elderly Americans should be nailed with the same taxes we impose on hotels and on the same regulations? Because as soon as they have to live under the rules of, say, like the Americans with Disabilities Act alone, they're done. They shut their door. There's no way they can offer anything on Airbnb again. So in the name of parity, what do we do about that? And that, that I mean, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with my own answer, which is to say sometimes an asymmetric playing field is necessarily a bad one. And there may be other benefits that those other institutions have that outweigh, you know, hotels still have other benefits that small Airbnb renters maybe do not, but they're still penalized by that differential regulatory treatment. Optimally, we would bring down that tax burden, we'd bring down that regulatory burden, but we're not going to limit it entirely on hotels. And that we're probably not going to limit it entirely for other sectors. Taxis is a little bit easier. You can imagine taxis and Uber and Lyft being very, very close. And in some localities, we're getting there. 
We're getting laws that basically say, look, you have to prove you have a license, you have insurance, and you pass a background check, and you're golden. Here you go. And, you know, that should apply equally to a taxi cab company versus anybody else. But, of course, we still have special localized regulations. Like in D.C., every taxi has to be painted the exact same way. There's no differentiating your taxi in D.C. Um, if I was a taxi cab company, that would be the first thing I complain about. Like, how is anybody going to notice me in a crowd and say, they're better, they're a different brand, if we all have to paint them red and silver? All right? But Uber and Lyft don't have to do that. So I'm glad about that. But again, the way to equalize that is to get rid of those painting regulations. We have time for one more question. So I just want to know, um, what, at what point is considering foreseeable risks a taking on a, a precautionary approach? Because mm -hmm. when you're saying that we shouldn't take this top-down approach to uh, regulations and policies, at what point do we say, okay, maybe we should consider that? Right. So like I discussed a moment ago, um, the way we do this in economics is through cost-benefit analysis. And what we do a lot of at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University is do cost-benefit analysis for various types of rules that are pending and say, well, here's where you should or should not be regulating or here are the costs associated with it. But that doesn't always answer the question that you've posed. And it's the one that I've discussed in answers to a couple of other questions, which is where do you define the harm as being immediate, irreversible, catastrophic, if you can agree that those would be the variables, of the, 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 the standard by which we make that determination. But debates rage about this. So I go to, I was at a law school conference at Boulder, the University of Colorado. I had a raging debate with a colleague, uh, with a friend who's always on the opposite side of privacy uh, regulation from me, a guy named Ryan Kahlo who's now at Washington. And we went on and on and on about how we define privacy harms. And as I got into the, the, the example of the camera, right, there was a time when taking someone's picture in public was considered a harm. But then all of a sudden it wasn't. Public photography is like, oh, we're going to be in some photos. We just got to get used to this, right? The question of how you define privacy harm is notoriously difficult to answer because it's the ultimate subjective kind of standard, right? It's an eye of the beholder problem. So we, in America at least, limit it to very clear examples of where you violated usually physical property, like you've come into my home and taken a picture or taken information from me, or you've come into a place that's private, like a locker room or something. We have standards for that. We regard that as the harm. Or we have financial privacy or medical privacy, and we have targeted laws that deal with that because we say that's so sensitive and the harm is so immediate, so costly. We're going to have that be treated as a real harm. But in all other cases, no. I mean, you think about everything we have on Facebook and Google and Apple and Microsoft and all these other digital sites and services, huge amounts of information about us. Some people call them digital dossiers, you know, that your entire life history. Is that a privacy harm in the aggregate that all that information is being collected? I would say no, it's not, or it should not be, but others profoundly disagree with me. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if we're ever going to be able to hammer it out for some things. So what I advocate in my work and in that chart that I showed you was to basically say, generally speaking, we should start with the idea that innovation is allowed. And we should see how things play out. And if serious harms do develop, then we should go after them. We should identify them. Go ahead. You want to follow up? Sure. Well, in, terms of like the 3D, sorry. in terms of 3D printing, mm -hmm. when you're talking about harm, um, say a user, I mean, so I guess my thing is, which party is liable for damages, a user or the product, in terms of 3D printing? Because you're talking about harm. Sure. And that's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, in the field of law and economics, debates raise about this exact issue. Um, and uh, there's actually a lot of work being done in the field of like driverless cars and drones uh, about exactly this question, the locus of liability. And I would argue that with most general purpose technologies, and I clearly think that 3D printers are, you want to be extremely careful and probably almost never apply that liability to the technology platform or provider themselves. And this was, by the way, the standard we used for the Internet. Uh, this week, in fact, 20 years ago yesterday, President Clinton signed the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which included an obscure provision called Section 47 U.S.C. 230, Section 230 of the Telecom Act, which essentially immunized online intermediaries from liability for the things that were done or said by third parties. So if you're Yelp, if you're eBay, if you're Yahoo, if you're anybody with a listserv or a website uh, or a blog, and people come and put information there, and it is defamatory or you know, hate speech or it's terrorism talk or something, you, the platform provider in this country under 47 U.S.C. 230, cannot be held liable for that. 
We have immunized the intermediary instead of deputizing them. them. But traditionally, the way regulations work is we deputize the middleman to go out and apply the laws that the state wants enforced. We chose a very different path for the internet, basing it on the idea that computing and internet networking technologies were going to be general purpose technologies that needed to be kept free and clear of that sort of onerous liability if we wanted commerce and speech to be vibrant on those platforms. I have argued in my work that Section 230 is the single most important law, internet law ever. And it may have been sort of an accidental law. I don't even think the legislators knew what they were doing when they wrote it, to be truthful. But it ended up working magic. Can you imagine right now if Yelp could be held liable for every crazy review left on it? Now, there are people who would like to see that. There was a famous case involving Joel Hadid, who's a carpet cleaning guy in Washington, D.C., who went out and tried to get the courts to force Yelp to take down bad reviews of his carpet cleaning service or at least tell him who was behind the bad reviews because he argued that they were li it was libelous and that he did not give them a bad carpet cleaning. He was very good, but they're just doing this to screw him. And he thought it was a competitor. He may be right. 47 USC made it flatly impossible for the courts to pierce that and to go after Yelp. Yelp could not exist if they were liable for that. Likewise, eBay or any types of site where you have a lot of people traffic in a, in a marketplace could probably not exist without that. I want to see that same kind of idea, that norm applied to 3D printing. I don't want to see the makers of 3D printers go to jail or be held liable for the crazy things people will do with 3D printers. There are exceptions to this. We have carve-outs to that norm of Section 230. We have a carve-out for federal crimes, and we have a carve-out for intellectual property. And we have a different set of rules for copyright that basically say we have like a notice and takedown regime for copyright that says the intermediary is not going to be held liable so long as they, once given notice that they have infringing material on their site, take it down. And this is how YouTube still exists, even though people sometimes do put up things that infringe copyright. Because so long as, as soon as they get a note from the copyright holder to YouTube and they take it down, they're okay. But that's different than what I just described for speech more generally. So I don't want to get into the law and economics of all this, but there's something called least cost avoider principle that basically says that the party who has the greatest knowledge about the crime should be the one who pays for it. Least cost avoider. And least cost avoider is something that is an integral part of law and economics discussions. And you can make an argument that liability norms should and will change over time in the common law and that least cost avoider principle will, will shift the onus of liability. That's going to happen for cars. Right now in this country, when you go out and buy a car and something goes wrong in that car when you're driving down the road and you're in an accident, you're usually personally liable, and this is why we have vibrant insurance markets, to cover us in case of accidents. Only when there's a massive product defect with the car do the manufacturers get nailed. But as we move to a world of autonomous vehicles or intelligent vehicles, cars will know more and more about the driving experience and they will take over the driving experience. And it could be in the future, we just won't own cars anymore. There'll just be fleets of robot cars roving around. We'll say, I, I need a car. Here comes my robot car. Our car of the future will be a, a mashup of basically like Uber and smart car and zip car and something in between. In that world where we don't own our cars anymore, we're not going to be liable for the accidents. Insurance markets, by the way, will just probably go bye-bye. And, uh, and all the liability will shift up to the actual fleet provider or to the manufacturer. Hopefully there'll be a lot less need for all that liability because the cars will be smarter and robot cars won't be as likely to have, you know, get drowsy or drunk. <laughs> and they'll stay in their paths or lanes. But there the liability norm will hopefully, I think, shift over time as knowledge about the potential harm moves from the end user to the fleet provider or the manufacturer. But what I'm getting at is that every context is a little bit different. And what may be good in terms of liability norms for 3D printing may not be good for driverless cars and may not be good for drones. And in drones right now, the way this is playing out is that we're thinking maybe we'll go out and hold people liable if they do dumb things with drones, but the real problem there is how do you identify them? And right now, the government is trying to create a federal database to register anybody who owns a drone. And part of the argument is, and it's a pretty good one, then we'll be able to identify who's liable when that drone crashes on somebody's heads or peeps into their bedroom window. But if I can 3D print my drone, <laughs> put it in the air without any identification number and I don't register it, how do you stop me, right? I'm not gonna do that, by the way. 
Anyway, I think that's it, right? Okay, so we've Thank hit you. the end. Thank you, Adam. That was great. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome to join us at Flames. We'll be heading over there soon, and uh, it sounds like there's still a few more questions, so we look forward to seeing you. Thank you for coming tonight.